a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, 1 being not so bad, how nervous were you that night when the lander's going into land and you're in that, <laughs> not even in the seven minutes of terror yet, you're into that, you know, just as you're was, hitting the surface. I was pretty, I, it was funny because I was perfectly fine with it for the longest time and it really only hit me like literally 15 minutes out where I started to get nervous. I think I started to go to like a mild state of shock because I was shivering and had a light sweat going on. So I would say I was maybe a five from one to 10, but it, it's just one of those things because it's out of your control, completely out of mm-hmm. your control. And so, but then the telemetry started to come in and the telemetry was indicating that everything was going normally in terms of timing, in terms of velocity. So we knew everything was fine. And so, and, so, and then when that final, that picture finally popped up at the very end, it was like, oh <laughs> So this week we're privileged to have Dr. Anita Sengupta on our podcast. Welcome to the show, Almost Rocket Science, Dr. Sengupta. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for giving me your time here. You know, you're busy traveling to the East Coast, and we appreciate that you could fit us in. So Happy to do it. Cool. Um, So you're part of a team, or you're still part of a team, that landed an amazing scientific rover on the surface of another planet, Mars. And it's like, the question for us is like, why Mars? Why, Why go there? Why go to Mars? Yeah. Oh, well, so there's many reasons to go to Mars. I mean, one is it's one of the terrestrial planets, which means that, um, you know, it it actually had a really interesting history over the course of time. And we actually believe in the beginning of time that Mars was actually once warm and wet and potentially habitable. So by sending spacecraft to orbit Mars and to visit the surface of Mars, we can actually determine whether or not, indeed, life once did exist on the planet and life could even exist today on the planet. And so the best way to do that is actually send spacecraft and rovers to land and drive around the surface of Mars and look for water and look for evidence of past life and past habitability. Yeah, and you know, you think about sending stuff to Mars, though, I mean, you must get a little bit scared with all the logistics behind that. I mean, knowing that really only two nations have been successful in landing spacecraft in working order on the surface of that planet. Yeah, it's, it's an engineering challenge, but I think that's the reason why all of us who do EDL, entry, descent, landing, is because it's so difficult. So for me, the more challenging the problem, the more difficult the problem, the more likely I am to want to do it. So when I was approached to work on the, on the team and on the mission, I kind of jumped at the opportunity because it's kind of a, it could conceivably be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Hopefully not. Hopefully it'll happen a few more times, but it's a once-in-a-decade opportunity. <laughs> that's true. You only can do so much in a time. So why don't you take us to that night? You're at, J- uh, I would assume you're in JPL headquarters there or the NASA center, and you're in mission control or in one of the other rooms. What's going through your mind as you're no- hoping your hardware is working as you tested? Yeah, I, I spent several months not being worried, and then as landing night approached, I became more and more worried. And then we were about 15 minutes out at Crusade's separation, and I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is it. And so that's when I started to get really nervous um, because, obviously, it's fully autonomous. There's nothing you can do at that point, so whatever's going to happen is going to happen and the software has got to play itself out all the systems have to work as planned so I was always nervous as anyone should be because there's only so many things that you have under control but we you know we did as good a job as we could from an engineering sense to make the system as robust as possible to apply margins appropriately to understand the fundamental physics that was going on at least behind my specific element that I worked on the parachute Mm -hmm. so I was as confident as I could be as an engineer but I was as nervous as I should be as a person and where you can't predict all the unknowns. And that's an interesting point, because I think in the end, if you think about our space program here in the United States, we started taking, as the public, started taking the shuttle for granted. And you would think that with the track record of landing two rovers already, uh, uh, Curiosity, or not Curiosity, Opportunity and Spirit, you're, and even on other Pathfinder missions and all the things that we've landed on that surface, now you're like, okay, we could do this, right? But it wasn't that way, right? I mean, it was... It was different. So this one definitely pushed the envelopes of all of our technology. So we were landing the heaviest rover that we've ever landed to date, 950 kilograms, roughly 2,000 pounds, the size of a small car. We were improving our landing precision by actually using hypersonic guidance. We actually have to fly the entry vehicle vehicle around like an airplane by banking it and pitching it and yawing it. Um, We were using the largest parachute that we've ever built before, experiencing the highest load, deploying at the highest Mach number, Mach 2, on Mars. And then we were using a brand new system called the Sky crane so that we could um, have a more precise landing land in a more interesting, more difficult terrain. So all of those things were essentially new this time around. And so this was going to be our first time using this system. So there was a lot of engineering and hard work that went into it and obviously concerns that you know things wouldn't work out quite as planned, but everything planned, worked out nominally, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Now, so yeah, you're talking about all these different set systems that you're putting in, in lining up your ducks 
so to speak. What I mean, what kind of time frame are we talking about from the your work starting in this program to the finish? So I started on the program in 2005 um, with the parachute development. There were some people who started before me, so probably back in 2003, in some cases 2002, mm -hmm. where they were doing more of the planning phases of the mission, looking at the different architectures that could go. And then, of course, we launched in 2011. So um, you know, it's several. It's a several year development cycle. And um, obviously we had a slight delay in our launch because you only get to go to Mars every 24 um, calendar months. And so we, we weren't able to make the 2009 launch date, so we were able to make the 2011 launch date. But So I would say in terms of the parachute development, it's a four-year activity. Okay. Very interesting. So we're here right now in, in Boston University in the engineering one of the facilities that maybe it was one that you were actually in, I'm not sure. But how do you go from Boston, Massachusetts as an engineering student to landing the most advanced piece of scientific hardware in the in universe at this point that we know of <laughs> on another planet so far away. How did you get there? I, I guess it's been, it's been an interesting journey, and it's ironic that it comes full circle today when I'm here in my undergraduate school. But um, I did my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering here at, at BU, and I guess from 1994 to 1998. And I always went into aerospace engineering because I always wanted to be part of the space program. I always wanted to be involved in space exploration, specifically interplanetary space exploration. So I guess I've structured my career since you know graduating in 1998 to the present day, um, working on different aspects of the space program. My first job um, actually was working on the development of the Delta IV launch vehicle. Um, then I went off to work on the development of uh, electric propulsion engines. So my PhD is actually in electric propulsion and ion thrusters. And so I worked on XM satellite light radio. I worked on the Deep Space One mission. I worked on another mission called Prometheus. Um, and so that took me up until around 2005. And then I was approached um, asking if I wanted to lead the parachute development for MSL, which was completely different from what I had done to date, which was more propulsion oriented. But it seemed really challenging. It was still very much aerodynamics. It was involved in going to Mars. And it just seemed like a, a great opportunity to use my sort of research skill set, my experimentalist skill set on an entirely new challenge. And, and then between 2005 and today, um, I've been working on the development of that, and, and everything's worked out um, as planned. <laughs> we, we're appreciative of that. I know the whole world was watching that night, really. I mean, it was amazing to see the footage the next morning, or, or even as it was going on, if people lined up in Times Square and other places around the world, just waking up or staying up late and on the East Coast for us and watching or, and waiting for word. I mean, it wasn't like we, something we could see. Again, it was almost like when Neil Armstrong landed and touched down, and we weren't watching necessarily live, probably, but... Now we get to see this. It's really cool to think about. Still boggles our mind. Yeah, definitely the highlight of my career to date. So <laughs> it was hard to describe in words when the, the image first popped up of, of Curiosity taking a picture of her shadow. It was just kind of you know icing on the cake for all those years of hard work. So And, and also for me, seeing the parachute descent that was captured by MRO, that was kind of amazing. I bet so, you that those yeah, got to be plastered like, somewhere on your <laughs> wall. I bet that image. I know I would. So why don't, since you were working on EDL in this case, why don't you tell us a little bit about what EDL is? Okay, so EDL, it stands for Entry, Descent, and Landing, and so it's the engineering system that you use to get yourself from um, exoatmospheric and then atmospheric interface point down to the ground. So it's all about dissipating your energy. So in the case of a Mars entry, and in the case of MSL, we were coming in at around 13,000 miles an hour, and so our job with the entry system was to slow ourselves down from 13,000 miles an hour down to about 2 miles an hour in a time period of about 7 minutes. And, and because you have an atmosphere on Mars, it actually helps you in the sense that you're able to use aerodynamic drag to slow yourself down, but because you have an atmosphere on Mars, it also hurts you because then you have to mitigate um, aerodynamic heating that you experience on the vehicle. So we have a several different set of technologies that we use for different phases, and so we have the hypersonic to supersonic phase where we use a heat shield and a rigid air shell to slow ourselves down, and then we have a supersonic to subsonic phase where we deploy a supersonic parachute, which was my primary person from the purpose on the mission. And we slow ourselves down to subsonic speeds, and then that prepares us for our final terminal descent on retropropulsive, um, eight retropropulsive uh, retro rockets, basically, which slows us down from you know, roughly 250 miles an hour down to two miles an hour. And then we do our final, final terminal descent on the sky crane, which is the, 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 the device where the engine, <laughs> where the rover is being lowered on a tether and gets all the way down to the ground and lands softly, wheels down without the need for a landing pad, and also to increase the distance between the engines engines nozzle planes in the ground which helps minimize the amount of erosion that you experience due to the plumes and pinching with the ground environment so it sounds 
it is complicated and it has many different aspects to it. There's many engineers who worked on each different phase of the mission and then engineers who worked on piecing the entire thing together. And it was a wonderful you know, um, team uh, building experience, a wonderful team environment, and we couldn't have pulled it off without everyone's individual expertise. So. I think that's a great point, adding that team aspect to it. Now, so in your, how many people were on the supersonic parachute team then? Let's see. I mean, so we, we did it in conjunction with our primary vendor, um, mm-hmm. who's actually located in Connecticut, <laughs> Pioneer Aerospace. And so they were people who fabricate the parachute. We also had people who helped us conduct um, supersonic test programs at NASA Ames. So there's probably about five to ten people involved at NASA Ames. We had another team of people where we did testing over at NASA Glenn Research Center. We had a team of probably about ten to fifteen people working on it. Um, we did some more testing at NASA Ames as well at a smaller facility where we had probably around fifteen to twenty people working on it. And then a JPL, we probably only had around two or three people working on it from the hardware aspect, um, and then maybe one or two systems engineers working on it. So all in all, there was a lot of people who worked on the development over the years, um, and the focus was on fabrication of the parachute, and then really largely on um, test of the parachute, both in subsonic conditions and supersonic conditions. And one thing I should add is we also had a computational fluid dynamics program, which um, was led by two different universities, and so we had university students working on it, um, as well as their professors and postdocs and PhD students. Wow, that's really so. cool to think about. <laughs> so, obviously, a lot of engineering went into that, and you could see how your aerospace and mechanical engineering routes took you to that, where you got now. That's really cool. Um, one of the things we like to do is, obviously invite students, our audience hopefully, uh, to ask questions. And so we got some questions here. Um, you mentioned one of them uh, about how much curiosity weight you said, about 2,000 pounds, I think 950 kilograms. But how does the reduced gravity at Mars be- impact that weight and the design of the landing system at that point? Well, you, so you take into account the gravity in terms of, so you have to do an end-to-end trajectory simulation where your force is on the vehicle, there's drag in one direction, and then there's gravity in the other direction. So you have to account for the gravitational force, and you actually have grav to help you with that. So we do take into account the reduced gravity, but the other problem that we have is the atmosphere is so thin that we don't get as high of a drag force as you would get on Earth. Mm-hmm. And so uh, as a result, uh, the parachute, for example, has to be much larger than the parachute needs to be on Earth because you a much thinner amount of atmosphere, so you need more drag area. But we do take into account um, uh, we take into account the atmospheric properties in terms of how much aerodynamic drag we're going to get. We take into account the winds that we see and how that can move us around and blow us around. We also take into account the gravitational pull, and that's how we're able to calculate what our terminal velocity is for each of the different phases. Mm. So even though you were sending something to Mars that landed or weighed quite a bit here on Earth, when it gets there, it's going to weigh uh, less, a third. Yeah. But then you have the same thing as now you have no atmosphere, so you're kind of almost, in a sense... You, you're in a similar out. boat, yeah. Okay. So, so you have to take all of those things into account. Uh, and, and so, like, if you were landing on the moon, for example, where there is no atmosphere, and I think it's about one-eighth the gravity, so it's still an issue, but then you can slow yourself down just with retro rockets because you don't have to deal with an atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that case, you don't get the benefit of an atmosphere in terms of helping you slow you down. You have to carry an, an entire amount of propellant to accommodate that velocity difference. But, mm. but we, we take into account all those variables when we do our engine and trajectory simulations. So it's just basically force equals mass times acceleration. So. Okay. <laughs> Easy enough. We love Newton. So one of the students asked, uh, why a rocket landing on Mars or that retro rocket, uh, not just either some kind of balloon landing or just a parachute alone? Parachute. Well, so um, on the prior missions for the Mars Exploration Rover program and for the Pathfinder program, we were able to use airbags. And so airbags have a certain... Uh, payload mass limit to them, and so airbags simply don't exist to land something as heavy as the Curiosity rover. So unfortunately, it was thrown out just because the airbag technology doesn't exist. In addition, when you have airbags, you end up um, having to bounce around quite a bit on the ground, which reduces your landing accuracy. And then the other problem is with airbags, you have to have a landing platform and a self-writing mechanism so that when the thing opens up, if it's upside down, it has to write itself. And then all of that mass that you expended on this landing platform and self-writing mechanism is essentially wasted mass, and you'd mm-hmm. rather have that mass go on the rover for its drivetrain system, for its its payload, basically. So it's more mass efficient to do it this way, where you land it wheels down first. And then what was the second part of your question? I, I guess they were talking about why not a parachute the whole way. Oh, or... so you can't, you cannot make a parachute big enough to give you a sufficient amount of drag area in order to get you down to that low terminal velocity that you need at landing. So mm-hmm. it's just because the atmosphere is so thin. So you would need a parachute, which is so big that it's just not conceivable to fabricate it or deploy something that mm-hmm. big. Um, and eventually the weight of the parachute will get so heavy because mm-hmm. it's so big that it ends up adding weight to the vehicle. So it just unfortunately isn't possible because the atmospheric density is so thin. So you can only get so slow with a parachute. And at that point, you have to take out the rest of your velocity with um, retropropulsion. 
Okay. And in that case, the other thing you mentioned was you were really, the team was really looking at landing it at a specific point. Yes. And really working on that pinpoint accuracy as opposed to just hoping it floats to a location yeah. or one so of those things. Our, our, so for prior missions, you were talking like 100 to 200 kilometer landing ellipse accuracy, so that's ellipse mm-hmm. on the surface of Mars that you can land inside of. So this particular mission, we shrunk it all the way down to around 20 kilometers by 7 kilometers, and that allowed us to go to a landing site, which was more interesting to the scientific community. In order to have a smaller landing ellipse, you have to have a more precise EDL system, which means that you have to have hypersonic guidance, which you actually have to fly a little bit when you're in the hypersonic mm-hmm. phase, um, and then you have to have um, the ability ability to land more precisely on the surface for the final terminal descent. So the airbags wouldn't have worked for that reason, and the ballistic entry system for MER and Pathfinder wouldn't have worked for that reason to give us that 20-kilometer by 7-kilometer landing ellipse. I, I was telling my students at school that uh, if they went to the football field and took a dart and threw it at the end zone at a moving plate, that might have worked as what you guys were trying to do, but now I think it needs to be a penny, <laughs> <laughs> much tighter. So that's really cool. I mean, th- um, so, yeah, what... At what point do you gain any experience by landing the previous rovers and those previous missions? What can you take away from that and apply to something that's so complex? Oh, you can you can gain a lot. So one of the things that we've gained over years is a better understanding of the Martian atmosphere. And so the, just like we have an atmosphere on Earth, they've got winds on Mars. There's mm-hmm. diff- atmospheric density varies as a function of altitude, varies as a function of location on the planet. Atmospheric temperature varies as a function of location and altitude on the planet. Uh, the dust actually affects those things. And so we have wonderful models of the atmosphere, which we u- feed into our trajectory simulations, which allow us to tell us how our entry system will perform. Another way that we gained from the prior missions is that when we use this blunt body aeroshell, it has a particular shape, and that particular shape has a certain drag coefficient associated with it. And so we've used that shape for many missions in the past, and so now we've developed something called an aerodynamic database, which tells us how, what, how that drag changes as a function of Mach numbers are coming in, so we're able to use that in our end-to-end simulations. Similarly, for the parachute, the parachute also has a certain drag coefficient associated with it as a function of Mach number. We've been able to use those measurements that we've made from prior missions. Um, so we're able to make, uh, and the other thing we also have is we do computational fluid dynamic simulations to determine things like um, aerodynamic heating and how the mm-hmm. vehicle performs dynamically. And from all those prior missions, we're able to take data from that to validate those codes, and then we can use those codes for the next mission. So from a new technology perspective, we kind of have to push the envelope. We have to go with a new thermal protection system material this time around because mm-hmm. our heating rates were even higher. We had to go with a larger parachute, deploying it at a higher Mach number before, so it pushed us outside of the bounds of these prior aerodynamic databases, but we were still kind of on the edge of them. So mm-hmm. we had to augment that with some additional test programs this time around. But we certainly always leverage as much as we can from the prior missions um, for the future missions. Very cool. Um, one of the students wanted to know what type of propellant was used in those retro rockets, I guess. It's um, hydrazine, so it's mon- they're monopropellant thrusters, so they only operate on a single propellant, and it's called hydrazine, monomethyl hydrazine, and when it um, burns up and decomposes, it actually decomposes primarily into ammonia, nitrogen, and hydrogen as the byproducts. Okay, and their follow-up question was really, does that now leave some sort of contaminant on the surface of Mars? Well, so the the, the decon the you fortunately most of the hydrazine, which is actually a pretty toxic substance, does decompose because it it, it happens at a really high temperature inside the nozzle of the engine. So you're left with the the ammonia, the hydrogen, and the nitrogen. So ammonia, I guess people don't necessarily like ammonia, but in terms of contamination, um, uh, not really. So it, it, and, and it's the propellant that we've been using for all the prior Mars missions. So mm-hmm. it can only it can contaminate in the sense that if, if where you're landing and the samples that you're landing on, now they've been affected and heated by the, the exhaust jets from the engine. But, um, but we will drive away from that site, so the, the other sites that we go to won't have that issue at all. So your science has to take place outside of a certain radius that you'd, you've developed? You'd rather it would, because otherwise you've, you've affected the, the surface by the fact that you have these hot gas jets flowing mm-hmm. there. You've exposed them to a high temperature. There's also a which is hitting the surface. So if you wanted to have a pristine measurement of what the actual chem- chemical composition is, you probably don't want to look right at the site where the engine's impinged. So that works out good in the sense that the first thing that we always want to see is the pictures of the surface anyway, so that won't really impact too much. The <laughs> yeah. first, that's the first scientific data we really get, I would think, right? Yeah, I think so. 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 All right. Um, one of the students also, th- or the group wanted to know, uh, a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, 1 being not so bad, how nervous were you that night when it the lander's going into land, and you're in that. <laughs> not even in the seven minutes of terror yet. You're into that, you know, just as you're I mean, hitting the surface. I was pretty, yeah. I, it was funny because I was perfectly fine with it for the longest time, and it really only hit me 
like literally 15 minutes out where I start to get nervous. I think I started to go to like a mild state of shock because I was shivering <laughs> and had a light sweat going on. So I would say I was maybe a five from one to 10, but it, it's just one of those things because it's out of your control, completely out of mm-hmm. your control. And so, but then the telemetry started to come in and the telemetry was indicating that everything was going nominally okay. in terms of timing, in terms of velocity. So we knew everything was fine. And so, and so, and then when that final, that picture finally popped up at the very end, it was like, <laughs> and with the amount of testing it, it has to build in some level of confidence doesn't it it does and, and that's the thing is like I know in my area I did an incredible amount of testing and an analysis to figure out exactly what was going to happen to that parachute so I had a really good idea in my head what it was going to experience and then we were able to translate um, that, that knowledge into designing a parachute which was strong enough to survive that environment but there's always the things that are out of your control like you know for whatever reason something fails which was just a completely random fluke event or you had a six sigma day on Mars and those things are just kind of out of your control but you do what you can with um, you know the system that you've analyzed and all of your your teammates have also done the same due diligence in their systems and then the systems engineers have pieced everything together so you know you are taking it on faith but we've worked with each other for so long and worked Mm. so hard on it that um, we were we did everything we could do in advance so you're coming into the Mars surface now. You you mentioned that there are certain variables you can't really control. It's out of control. Were you concerned that the weather might play an issue? Because you've launched now seven months prior. All your testing is done years and months before, and now it's like it's just up to whatever happens on Mars that day. I mean, how much did the EDL have to maneuver around any weather? Well, so what we do is we do a statistical um, analysis ahead of time. So you you could take worst case of everything and pile it on top of each other. That ends up making you fly a tank on Mars and you have to carry too much propellant and you wouldn't have a mission. So what you do is you make an assessment of what the average values are going to be. Then you know what the low end and the high end is going to be. And on top of that, you can apply an uncertainty. And you put that all into a statistical simulation and you're able to pop out sort of three sigma worst case estimates of a whole different bunch of variables. So, for example, for the parachute, what comes out of that is a three sigma worst case load that the parachute's going to see, and a three sigma worst case um, maximum deployment pressure and Mach number the parachute's going to see. So then you design the parachute at that number with some additional margin. And so that's the way you accommodate all of those unknowns. Now, if you ended up being six sigma, for example, then you're pushing the envelope of what would be acceptable. Um, mm-hmm. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But when you do three sigma, you're at 99.9% probability. So you can never design to 100% probability because then you're flying a tank, but you can design to a really pretty high probability of success, and that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is if a CME or coronal mass ejection hits Mars, how does that impact the spacecraft at that point, the rover itself? Do you know if it has? I don't think it does. So, I mean, the coronal mass ejection is spewing out high-energy electrons into mm-hmm. space, and I think probably by the time those high-energy electrons reach a distance as far as Mars, they don't have as much energy that they probably okay. lost some energy with collisions and things like that. Or So um, I guess I think that's more of an issue, like if you're near the sun or if you're on Earth's moon, for example. But mm-hmm. by the time you get to Mars, it's less of an issue. There's also an atmosphere on Mars, which a lot yeah. of that should be reabsorbed into the atmosphere. So I don't think that would have much of a play. I think it has more of an issue for, like, solar flares and maybe something in Mars orbit might get um, some kind of spike in its signal or maybe some people have a single event upset. Mm -hmm. Um, But but in terms of what's going on on the surface, I don't think it would be an issue. Okay. Um, Another good question is, what surprised you most about Mars? What surprised me most about Mars? Or going there even. (laughs) Well, I am. Um, I think probably what surprised me most. Um, so I, I've always been very much on the technology side, on the engineering side, and I didn't spend as much on the um, Mars science side. And over the past two years or so, I've been working a lot more with the Mars science community, mm-hmm. and I've learned several very interesting facts about you know the history of Mars. One being that we know that Mars was once warm and wet and habitable, which to me says, wow, there could have been life on the surface and, and there could even be life today. So that to me, you know, just gives, invigorates you with the whole reason of this is why we want to go there. Um, and then I'd say the other thing is that fact that Mars actually is undergoing some really interesting climate changes today. So we know that there's actual uh, putative water seeps on um, active flowing water on the surface of Mars that comes out of the sides of cliff faces as the planet heats up. So that's yet another place that we'd like to go to and sort of interrogate, you know, what's in that water source? Could there be organics? So for me, I think what has amazed me over the past two years is that there's Mars science is so fascinating and Mars's past and Mars's current, you know, evolution is so relevant and it's also relevant to whether or not humans can live there one day and be able to tap into liquid water sources and be able to set up colonies. So it's pretty exciting. Very cool. 
Now, do you in that in that case in that case do you have any other missions that uh, you're worked on or you're planning or you know are in planning stages to go to other planets or uh, moons of planets in our, in our solar system? So there's there's a lot going on right now, and so I was just working on a study actually to land. Um, uh, we're calling them low-cost landers on the surface of asteroids, comets, and protoplanets. So there's another mission that I worked on a while ago, which is the Dawn mission, which I sent an orbiting spacecraft out to Vesta and to Ceres. Right. And so Ceres is actually, it's not even an asteroid, it's so big that it's called a protoplanet. And so we might actually want to land something there one day, and there could be volatiles on the surface like water, there could be minerals, there could even be presence of organics, we don't actually know. So there's, there's always a plan to do future uh, low-cost landed missions to these um, airless bodies, they're called. I'm also working on a mission which is studying it going to Europa and so the initial idea was to have a lander on Europa then when we decided we don't know enough about the surface properties of Europa so we're probably going to have an orbiter that goes around Europa and Europa actually has a liquid water ocean beneath around a 20 kilometer thick layer of ice so we'd like to send a mission there and see whether or not we can find organics that might be present in the ocean which have upwelled to the surface. we're also talking about having future Mars landed missions for the purpose of Mars sample return. That's a little bit out in the future. And I was actually just developing um, a Mars ascent vehicle over the past year um, mm-hmm. with some industrial partners so that we can actually take a five kilogram sample of Martian soil, stick it inside of a capsule, put it inside of a rocket on the surface of Mars, and then launch that up into Mars orbit, which then gets captured by another vehicle and <laughs> sends it back to Earth. And yes, I've worked on many different um, uh, potential missions that are coming up in the near future. And of course, we have the InSight mission in 2016 now which is going to be the next Mars lander mission. That's very cool. Yes, I'm happy it's going. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, your specialty is this supersonic parachute. So we're talking about deploying a parachute, something made of fabric. I mean, I can think of... I can show it to you if you All want. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is not the actual one. This is a subscale representation of it. So this is roughly a 3.5% scale of the MSL parachute, and it's got the same geometric configuration. It's called a disc gap band parachute. So this okay. is the disc region here, which looks like a circular parachute. This is the gap, which is an open space in between, and this is the band region of the parachute. It's fabricated from nylon, um, which is a very strong lightweight material, and the suspension lines or the skeleton of the parachute actually made out of Kevlar. So Kevlar is the same material as bulletproof vests. Mm -hmm. And so what you need for parachutes to be, it's very light and very strong um, and very flexible. And so this is a subscale version that we actually tested supersonically in a wind tunnel out at NASA Glenn. And so we used these parachutes actually to assess um, what its flight was going to be like on Mars because we actually can control the parameters in the wind tunnel to match the parameters on Mars. And so we can determine um, how it like inflates and collapses, what its drag performance is, and and to make sure that it will survive its flight on Mars. And as you can see, this one um, has been through many flights and so the vent region is slightly damaged but it's been tested and it did its thing so (laughs) that's really cool so yeah i mean you're talking about deploying what kind of forces are you dealing with when you get to a situation like that you're deploying at that high a lot of sixty-five thousand pounds if you can imagine how much force that is that's the peak load that that the parachute has to see and so all of that has to be accommodated as you can see now this is a slightly smaller version of course but in the full scale a bunch of these suspension lines the load gets distributed between these suspension lines Mm -hmm. and eventually it terminates in a a, a single bridle like this and okay. each one of these little bridle legs has to be able to handle 65,000 pounds now the flight ones are actually a little bit bigger than this they're probably about you know five times as thick as this but you can still tell it's a it's a fabric um, textile member that has to handle that kind of load so it's pretty impressive <laughs> wow. just unreal to think about actually yeah so, so what do you notice about the difference now of working on a descent you know the EDL portion of a mission, and now talking like you just mentioned, bringing bringing something back, working on the ascent level. How oh, ascent change? level. Well, so my first job actually was working on the Delta IV launch vehicle, so it's okay. kind of ironic that it comes back full circle. But it's 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 similar in the sense that you know one way you're 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 going up through an atmosphere, the other way you're coming down through an atmosphere. So one you're accelerating, the other one you're decelerating. But you still have to both experience g forces. You can still uh, both experience um, aerodynamic heating. Um, mm-hmm. The rocket is more of a propulsive problem, a chemical propulsion problem. Problem, whereas um, EDL um, entry descent and landing is more of a aerodynamic drag, drag problem, so it's just basically forces acting in opposite directions. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a technical challenge because we've never uh, launched anything on the surface of another planet before, so this would kind of be the first time that we do that. So we would have the same problems of being able to do Earth based ground testing and making sure that it's representative of the actual flight that it's going to see on the surface of Mars. And that's pretty tricky for a rocket development, right? Where gravity really does come into play and, and the, um, the a- a- ambient atmospheric pressure is really going to come into play mm-hmm. because it actually will change like the structure of the plumes coming from
something from the engine. I was going to say, right. we, we have a little bit of experience when we talk about bringing our astronauts back from, from the moon, but they didn't have an atmosphere to deal with, so there's nothing to worry about up there as yeah. far as you're talking about. Yeah. Which way is it going? It's, it's, it's difficult because, um, so one of the things that we had to deal with on MSL is that during the terminal descent phase, we have um, four of the eight engines which are operating. Mm-hmm. And so if you operate, if you do a test where you see what that engine operation looks like impinging with the ground in earth-based pressure, it looks nothing like it looks when you have that engine operating the ground in Mars-based pressure because um, a lot of the energy actually gets dissipated from the plume when the amb- ambient pressure is higher. But when you have an intermediate pressure like you do on Mars, that uh, pressure doesn't get dissipated. It all goes straight into wow. the ground and creates this pretty large erosive force. Whereas on the moon where you have no pressure, um, the plumes become completely decollimated and the pressure is spread out over a large, uh, smaller, a larger area, mm-hmm. which, which also solves the problem. So Mars represents a unique challenge in that regard wow. for the development of a rocket, especially. Very cool. You have an amazing career. You've done a lot of great things. You're um, in a field that's probably not dominated by too many women, I would imagine, right? No. (laughs) Okay. So what do you tell young people, especially female students, looking up and wondering if they can reach out to such challenging uh, STEM careers like yourself? How do they go for it? What do you tell them? Well, so for me, um, I always knew that I wanted to be involved in the space program. So ever since I was six years of age I was a science fiction fanatic so it's like I know I want to go there and I know I want to do that so I've always been you know pretty highly motivated to put myself on that path and so you and you can start structuring your career as early as middle school right where by choosing the right classes so you want to study as many math and science classes as you can specifically if you can calculus otherwise pre-calculus and certainly chemistry and physics um, are big ones if you want to study engineering now, I think um, having and looking to good role models for what it is that you want to do. So if you saw some person out there who's an engineer or who's a scientist or who's a technologist who does what you want to do, you should take a look at what they did over the course of their career and how they got there. And if you can, you know, have meetings with these people. So if you have teachers at school who you, you, know, you believe uh, followed the right career path or ask your teachers at school to try and set you up as somebody who followed a similar career mm-hmm. path. Um, now, in terms of how you get there, it's... It isn't really that difficult. So if you are motivated and you are a good student and you want to do this, there's no reason why you can't do it. So you just go and get yourself into an engineering program, an undergraduate, and study pretty much any type of engineering, aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. And then whilst you're in school, try and do internships at NASA centers or at air, in aerospace companies, and that will set you up for your first job. Now, if you decide to go to graduate school first, you could major and do research in the areas that interest you. But there's almost nothing to stop you from succeeding. And typically, the only limitations are the ones that you place on yourself. So if this is something you want to do, you can do it. You just have to go and study engineering. And you know, a bachelor's degree might be enough for you, or you might want to get a master's degree and a PhD. And, and then and getting a NASA internship in the summertime is also a straightforward thing to do and that's how you get into the space program pretty much so it's not it it isn't that I mean it's only complicated in the sense that you do have to work hard right you have to want to study you have to want to do your homework you have to want to learn but the job is incredibly interesting it's intellectually stimulating I mean how many people get to say that you know they land things on other planets so and if this is what you want to do you could do it there's really nothing to stop you but yourself Thank you for those great words. Thank you for being one of those role models and for giving of your time for our little podcast here. So, Oh, I'm happy to. So. We appreciate it. Sure.